My name is Carol Liggins. My maiden name is Danforth. I was born in Green Bay. And um, spell spell your uh, your full name, your maiden name, and your your married name. Spell it. Yes, yeah, so we can have it for the make okay. sure we got it right record. C A R O L E D A N F O R T H Liggins L I G G I N S. Okay. Now, what was your parents? Uh, give us a, your parents' name. My mother was Alfreda Smith, and my dad is Carl Danforth. Okay. Uh, do you remember the names of your grandparents? Yes, my father's um, parents were Amy Danforth and John Danforth. And my mother's parents were Marina Smith and Melton Smith. Okay. Let's start with your dad's parents. Uh, where, did they, where did they reside? Um, they resided on... Near Chicago Corners on County H. Uh, it's where um, Eva Danforth lives right now. That was my grandparents on my father's side. That was their house. It's been since remodeled, but <laughs> that's where they originally lived. That was a New Deal place, wasn't it? I'm not sure. No? Okay. That was John? John and okay. Amy's house, yeah. Um, did you, uh, do you remember much about them? Not really. Um, I think John died when I was quite young, and but I remember my grandma Amy quite a bit. Why don't you tell us about her? Well, I remember that she uh, worked in town. She was a day worker, and she used to catch the bus to go into town to work. And she used to, um, when we lived in Wisconsin Rapids on a cranberry marsh when I was growing up, she used to come up there, and she was a cook for the primary workers for the, the borders. And she did that. Now you say she used to uh, catch the bus and she lived on H and Ranch Road? Mm -hmm. How did she get out to... I'm not sure. That's a, that was a long ways to go. Yeah. I imagine she, she might have done a lot of walking at one time. Probably, but mm -hmm. um, when there was... Well, when I was growing up, I remember um, that they used, she used to catch the bus down where White Eagles is now. Every okay. once in a while. That's one of the, probably in my mid-teens, I remember that. Okay. Um, did, your, uh, did, you, did your grandmother talk uh, Oneida? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, did she ever talk about her uh, education? No. Yeah. I, not that I remember. I, I was um, two around two years old when we moved away from this area and moved to Wisconsin Rapids, so I didn't have a lot of uh, interaction with my grandparents. Okay. Okay. And you don't know um, of uh, what background your grandfather, uh, you know, the occupation or schooling or anything like that? No, I Do don't. You know? oh, okay. All right, let's, let's look on your um, mother's side now. Uh, what was their names again? Melton and Marina Smith. Okay, did you, uh, can you tell us anything about them? Do you? Well, they live just around the corner from my, where my other grandparents live. They live on what's Ranch Road now, um, right near DP, where DPW is. And my grandfather had a little farm, and he had horses. And none of the, neither one of the houses had running water or electricity. So we used to have to pump water for the horses in the, in the summertime, I spent a lot of time with my grandparents on my mom's side. But <clears throat> we used, to, and they used to have a garden. And I remember in the summertime, we used to go out and have to weed the garden and do other things, you know, just feed the chickens and collect the eggs and that sort of thing. Now, um, what about, uh, uh, did they, did they speak Oneida? My grandmother did. I don't recall if my grandfather did. I'm, he probably did, but I don't ever remember him speaking it. Did they ever have, uh, do uh, any talking about um, to you about their their school or education? Um, not, no, not really. Um, but my mother uh, told me that my grandfather Melton had gone to Carlisle, so he was there for quite a while. And my grandmother, I'm not sure where she went to school. Do you know if any of your grandparents were involved in any of the uh, 
uh, tribal operations or the political uh, area at the time? Mm, I don't believe so. And what was the, uh, do, do you remember their means of transportation at the time? When I was growing up, they had automobiles, but um, my mother told me that my grandfather used to walk miles and miles when, I guess during the Depression, just to, just for work or just to go find food or, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. He walked as far as Bowler or Wittenberg or something, which is 45, 50 minutes by car now, so I don't know how long it took him. Okay, let's talk about your, uh, let's talk about your mother. Uh, tell me about her. What, uh, do, you, do you recall having any discussions with her in terms of her education? Well, I know that she graduated from high school, and she had gone to um, elementary school in Silver Summit. She had gone there to the different school, depending on where they lived, I guess. But uh, but she graduated from high school, and that's as far as she went to school. Okay. Um, did she speak Oneida? No. Um, she could understand it. And she still does, just you know, just a few words here and there. Okay, tell me about your aunts and uncles on your mother's side. Uh, do you remember them? Yeah, I um, I don't know how many there are. I'd have to name them. To, <laughs> to okay, go ahead. Them. go ahead. Um, I have an uncle Dean Smith, and he lives in Tucson right now. And uh, Big Sal is my uncle, and he passed away six, seven years ago. Erwin Smith, and he passed away um, maybe three years ago. And I had an uncle, his name is Raymond, but everybody called him Robin. And he passed away oh, my, over 20 years ago. And I had an aunt, Edith, and she's passed. And I think that's it. I have, well, I have an aunt, Becky, she's my same age. And she lives here in Oneida. That's uh, Elder? Uh, she's yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. Okay. Uh, where did, do you know where your, uh, well, you said your mother went to Silver Summit uh, for grade school? Yeah. And then she graduated from high school? Yeah. Okay. I think probably West De Pere. Okay. Did she go, uh, what kind of profession did she go into then? Or did she get married? Or oh, she got married. She, mm -hmm. Yeah. She married my dad. I think she was probably just out of high school, 18 or something like that, when she got married. Okay. And um, how many children did your mother have? Just myself and, and my sister. Okay. And your sister's name? Her name is Marina Paminet. Okay. All right, and uh, did your mother uh, uh, stay home or did she work out after you were, you were uh, she, the two of you were born? Uh, she stayed home. Um, Pretty much, and then as we got a little bit older, she uh, did day work in Wisconsin Rapids, and she also worked in the cranberry marsh and the in the warehouse where they did the sorting of the cranberries. And okay. that was a big fall event. A lot of Oneida people went up there. All right, tell me about your dad now. Um, I'm assuming he's from around here. Or yeah. Um, Where did he go to school, do you know? I really don't know. It's hard to talk about it because... Uh, oh, well, it's okay then. Uh, it's all right. Uh, he was killed when I was 16. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, well, let's talk about uh, about your situation then. Where where did you grow up primarily? You talk about the Cranberry Marsh. Yeah, I grew up primarily in, in Wisconsin Rapids. Um, like I said, we moved there when I was about two, and I was there till I graduated from high school. So, and in the summertime, we would uh, come out here for visits, and and we'd go to um, cherry picking up north, you know, and Door County, and um, I mean, it was a good time, mm -hmm. you know. Tell me about the cranberry marsh for somebody that wouldn't know anything about it except getting it out of a can. Oh. 
<laughs> well, in central Wisconsin, there's quite a quite a few cranberry marshes, and um, cranberries grow on vines, and they call them bogs or marshes. And in the fall is when they're harvested, generally in like September, maybe October. And in order to harvest them, they flood these bogs with water so the cranberries, because they're lighter, will float on the top. And then years ago, when the, a lot of Oneida men would go up there and work in the, in the fall, they would be, have hand rakes. Um, when you say a rake, it would be like a rake with a, with a bucket on it, with a handle. And they'd put those rakes through the, the vines, and then the forks on the end would grab the cranberries, and the cranberries would be in this, end up in the, like the bucket part of it. And that's what they did all day long in that water with hip boots on. And and then um, after that, they had cranberry raking machines, which was, I don't know how to even describe them, but they went through on the marsh and they had these rollers that went around and kind of grabbed the cranberries out of the vines and then they went on this belt and whatever. And they do this in the fall? Mm-hmm. Doesn't it get pretty cold? I think so, yeah. <laughs> you think uh, that it's spe especially sp spending a lot of time like that in the water. Mm -hmm. And um, they would have to, my dad My dad worked for um, John Potter who owned this cranberry marsh and he worked there year round, he wasn't just a seasonal worker. So um, he would have to go out in the middle of the night sometimes because they have to watch the temperature and um, especially towards the fall because they didn't want the berries to freeze, so they'd have to flood them with water. So if they sometimes they'd go out in the middle of the night because the temperature was dropping and open these little um, reservoirs or whatever, so that the water would go in and flood the flood the cranberries, so they wouldn't freeze. Now you see, um, you went to school in. Uh... I went to school in Cranmore. <laughs> Say that again. I went to school in Cranmore. Cranmore. Oh, that sounds like a swinging place. <laughs> yeah. And basically it was a, the school and the store. It's like a little township, you know, like um, Iser or something, you know, and nobody hear, heard of. But it was a one-room school that had, um, not a one-room school, it was a one building where all the grades were and we had um, four grades in one room and four grades in the other room. The upper grades were in the <laughs> in the other room. And that's where you went to school. That's where I went to to elementary school until the seventh grade, and then there was a consolidation of the school districts, and they bust all the kids that went to Cranmore into Port Edwards, which is right outside of Wisconsin Rapids. So that's where I went to high school. Now, was you say there were other Oneidas up there? There was. A few. Or just during certain parts of the year? Um, there was a um, couple of Nida families that lived there. Do you remember that? Yeah, one was um, um, Sickles, Pete Sickles and his family. Mm -hmm. And then his, I think it's his brother Hiram Sickles, they lived also on Cranberry Marshes. And um, they lived there year round. And, and then the other uh, Indian people around there were, um, they were called Winnebago's then, but they're whole chunks now. That's pretty much their territory, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Anyway, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, what uh, what churches did your uh, did your grandparents attend? Do you remember? My mother, my grandmother went to the Methodist Church, and my my grandmother on my mother's side, my grandmother Smith went to Methodist Church, and my grandmother Amy, she went to Episcopal Church. And um, where did your mother go to? She went to Methodist. Methodist? Yeah. Does she still go there? No. Um, she went to, uh, she's going to Episcopal Church now. Okay. She's remarried and um, her husband is, Alan is, is Episcopalian. So she started going there and that's where she stayed. Okay. All right. Um, when you were, um, you know, growing up in, uh, I'm trying to think where that place is, Cranberry, up in the Cranberry area. Mm -hmm. uh, did, uh, you know, what kind of activities or, or, uh, or things were you involved in when, uh, during, the, during that time? Uh, were you, you know, like in school, were you, 
you involved in any of the uh, school activities or anything? Or I was in um, not not one not so much when we were in elementary school, um, but they had the 4-H clubs and Girl Scouts, which I was in, and then in high school I was in the band. I played the French horn, I was in the marching band and stuff. That was fun. <laughs> and how often would you uh, come back to Oneida? Um, on every holiday. <laughs> and I don't know, it seemed like we were here maybe once a month. Maybe, maybe it wasn't that often, but it seemed like we were here quite a bit. And did you, you'd come up during the summers too then? Right. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. okay. right. Uh, did you happen to be uh, uh, around Oneida, like, let's say, during the Christmas holidays? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And where would you, um, uh, you know, where, where would you, let's say, attend church then? Would you, would you attend? Well, generally we went to the, the Methodist church. Methodist. Mm -hmm. And they always had that. Uh, Christmas program every year and it was fun you know sometimes we were here early enough to get involved with you know be a part of that I don't know if it was singing or or what but we would do that. What about uh, New Year's were you out here for New Year's sometimes? Probably but I really don't remember. Yeah. Did you ever have the opportunity to go ho -yanning? Oh yeah we did yeah. that. Cause, Tell me about that. Well we used to bundle up because it was usually cold and We'd walk down Ranch Road and um, who lived down the road? Our uh, Bernie Cornelius's parents. Luella. Luella. We go to her house and then we go to my grandma's house and all the different people down H, almost probably to Chicago Corners. We'd go hoyaning and come back and with all our donuts and. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh. Now you you say you moved back from uh, you, when did you move back or leave? Uh, I'm trying to think of the oh Wisconsin marsh. the marsh yeah, Wisconsin Rapids area um, when I graduated from high school. Okay, and what year was that? Do you remember? Sixty three, nineteen sixty three. Mm -hmm. And what what did you do then? Well, um, my dad had passed away, and we moved back here, and then I went to um, Haskell for a year. That was an experience. Tell me about Haskell. Is that was that your uh, were you a freshman then, or were you? I don't know how that's made up up there. Well, I think it was a. They called it Haskell Institute, and it was a two-year postgraduate school, whatever that means. Um, but I took up um, a business course, and I didn't really. Care. I mean, the schooling itself was okay. I didn't care for the. Um, I guess the restrictiveness of it, because we <laughs> we had to, um, some of the rules that I recall were we could only go to town on Saturdays, and if we went to town we had to wear dresses, all the girls had to wear dresses, and when we went from even one girl's dorm to another girl's dorm, we had to sign out of our dorm, get a pass, present it at the other other dorm, get signed in, and when we left there, we it was reversed, you know, you got... You know, they, they kept track of you all the time. <laughs> but there was, it was really nice because I met a lot of, a lot of Indian kids from all over. Now this is an Indian school. Yes. Mm -hmm. What was, what's the approximate attendance there? I have no idea. Uh, and their uh, Indians come from all over the United States? Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. And you spent a year there? Uh, one whole year, yes. Mm -hmm. I stuck it out. I didn't even come home for Christmas. <laughs> What, uh, what prompted you to go there to begin with? Uh, my mom, she thought it would be a good idea, you know, and I said, okay, why not? You know, so I went. I remember having to go shopping for clothes and getting this big old trunk to put all your clothes in because you were going to be gone for so long. <laughs> that must have been quite, a, quite an experience. That's yeah. the first time you're away from the family then, right? Yeah, for that length of time, yeah. Mm -hmm. My mother thought it was really odd because when I was an infant, if someone, I wasn't very outgoing and, and um, she said that if I stayed away, even with my grandparents for too long, I would get sick. I'd get homesick or just sick with a temperature and everything because I wanted my mommy. <laughs> so I guess I got that out of my system. 
And about how old were you then when you uh, were at high school? Um, 18. 18? I graduated when I was 17, so that fall I was 18. Okay. And then where do we go from high school? From high school, we come back to Oneida for a you couple said, months. You said we know. Uh, we, meaning you said where do we go, and so oh, I well, said. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, I thought maybe some no. uh, schoolmate was with you or something from there. No, I came back um, and I got a job in Milwaukee at John Winters, and they made they make clothing, and I was in this department where. They just carry this bundles of, of cut fabric from one place to another. It was called the bundling department. And I worked there that summer, and then I left Milwaukee and came back home, and I got a job at um, the pickle factory. Lar um, I don't know where it is, just the pickle factory, that's all I remember. I worked there until I got enough money to buy a bus ticket and I went to California where my sister had moved. Oh, okay. Your sister's older than you then? Yeah. Uh -huh. All right. And what was she doing out there? She had gotten married and her and her husband had gone out there on that relocation, which I really don't know a lot about other than they had an opportunity to to go to other parts of the country and I'm, I'm not sure how it all worked. Mm -hmm. But she was living in uh, California, near Los Angeles. So I w went out there for a visit and I stayed about almost 18 years. <laughs> That's a long time to visit your sister. <laughs> well, she left. You know, I went out there um, and then my aunt Becky, she, her and her husband at the time moved out there and they all moved back. And I stayed, got married and stayed stayed there. Okay. You want to tell me something about uh, what kind of work you did and your, the family <laughs> out there? Well, um, I didn't work for right after, until I, until my daughter, well, let me see. I got married and I wasn't working and then I had my youngest daughter and when she was about a little over two years old, I went to work at the post office. And it was, my mom was working at the post office back here. And she said it was a good job. And it just so happened that the post office at that time was looking for help. And they were actually advertising. They were putting things in your mailbox, you know, saying, come work for us, you know. So I took the civil service test, passed that, and, and um, got hired. And I got hired at a post office close to where I lived. <clears throat> so that's what I started doing. I worked at the Rosemead Post Office for 10 years. And then I transferred uh, to uh, San Juan Capistrano Post Office, which is in Southern California. And I worked there for about four or five years. And then I decided, well, I decided to move back home because I had a two-year-old daughter and her father's parents were all in the east and mine were in Wisconsin and so I thought well she's not going to get an opportunity to know any of her extended family unless I do something. <laughs> so I moved back here, quit the post office, moved back here. And what year was that? 1982. And then <clears throat> I was... Your daughter was how old at that time? Two. Two, okay. My younger daughter was two and my older daughter was 16. Oh, okay. And what are their names? My older daughter's name is Chrissy and my younger daughter's name is Lisa. Okay. And I moved back here and I was unemployed because I totally quit the post office, resigned uh, when I left California. So I was unemployed from about May until October and I was just living on my um, um, money I had gotten out of retirement. The money I put in, I withdrew that, so I had something to live on. And then I got rehired at the post office. 
Uh, George Farrow was a postmaster in Green Bay at that time, and I was rehired at Green Bay. I worked there for oh, about two years, <coughs> excuse me, and then I um, worked at uh, the Denmark Post Office. I was on an assignment as an officer in charge because a the postmaster there had left. And then I was home one day and George Farah's secretary called me and she said, wanted to know if I'd be interested in applying for the postmaster job in Oneida because that postmaster was going to be leaving and um, would I be interested? And I said, sure, you know, why not? Not in my wildest dreams I'd ever think that that, that could happen, but uh, when that position did come open, I applied for it and was appointed postmaster of Oneida. So I was postmaster of Oneida from 1984 or 85 until I retired two years ago. You have three minutes on this tape. Okay. Uh, when you moved back, did you move back to Oneida from yes. California? Yes. Yes. Okay. And um, where did you, where did you reside then? Well, initially I lived with my with my mom and stepdad until I found a house, and then I I bought a house on Van Boxtel Road. And then I um, I sold that, and my parents were living in a little house <laughs> that they had moved onto um, some property near my stepdad's parents. And the house was getting more and more dilapidated and they were gonna, actually it was condemned, I guess. And I was talking about um, building a different house or moving or whatever, so we got together and we decided that where we would live together, you know. Um, we'd help them out, help me out. So we looked around and we looked at houses and all over the place and we couldn't find anything that would that we felt would meet our needs. So um, we ended up I ended up building a house that's large enough for my my uh, my mom and stepdad and and my well my daughter was still was in high school at that time and so that's what I did. So mm -hmm. I moved. Where's that location? Over on Lambie Road, which is just not too far from where the old health center was. Mm -hmm. You're swinging a hammer and a nail over here on Lambie Road, right? Yep. Okay. <laughs> and that was about, uh, you say that was about 82 that you started, or just recent? Was it more recent than that that you built your house? It was, it was more recent than that. Oh. It was maybe 11 years ago. 11 years ago, okay. Yeah. And uh, you worked at the post office then for those years. Mm-hmm. But seems to me that you were also involved in other things uh, throughout the community. Uh, can you give me some background in, in reference to those things? Uh, what what committees or uh, commissions or volunteer activities that were you doing during, this, during those years? <coughs> well, since you came back from California, let's put it that way. Well, um, my first um, involvement in the community was on a suicide prevention committee. Um, my cousin had lost her son to suicide and so we were meeting, um, there was a little core team, there was Gail Ellis and uh, um, I can't remember everybody now, so, you know, so but okay. anyway that was our, our, our core team and we developed some posters and some things to put out in information like a helpline thing situation that we put out in in the bars and posters up. That was my first um, community involvement. And then um, my niece, my sister's daughter, came to live with me for a while. And she went to um, tribal school. And they had uh, elections for the school board, the Oneida school board. So I put, put my um, hat in the ring and ran for the school board as one of the parent parent positions and got involved in that. I was with the school board for eight years and while I was on the school board the tribe had started the appeals commission. I was in 91 
For and somebody that doesn't know what the Appeals Commission, maybe you could explain that. Well, it's the, 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 the tribe's judiciary. Um, and your dad, Lee, was, the, uh, was one of the first ap appeals commissioners. And he's the one who talked me into uh, running for one of those positions. He said they, they needed a lot of good people on there. And <clears throat> so he encouraged me, and I, I ran for the appeals commission, which is, um, like I said, the judiciary. And when it first started, all it was was a resolution, 81991A, an addendum. <laughs> and from that, um, we had to develop our our own policies, our procedures, um, our our um, just everything, everything from square one on how to develop a court. And so we did a lot of trainings those first years. And I was on the appeals commission, was reelected to that position for I think three different times, and um, I just was in my last term, last, during my last term, whatever that is, my current term, um, I had about a year and a half to go and I resigned from the, from the Appeals Commission to take a job with um, the Business Committee. <clears throat> and the Business Committee is the legislative branch of the government, and I felt it would be in conflict to work for the Business Committee and be on on the judicial side, so I resigned from the Appeals Commission. So, in, in actuality, uh, since you've retired, you've become more busy? Somewhat, yeah. Well, actually less busy, because now I have one job. Before I was working full-time as, as uh, the postmaster, and I was involved in the school board and the Appeals Commission at the same time, plus involvement in my church. So, I'm less busy now. I only have one job. <laughs> And what church are you involved with? Um, I'm currently uh, attending Oneida Apostolic Church. Our pastor is um, Pastor Juan. He's an Oneida tribal member. His mother, Harriet, was uh, a, a lay pastor at the Methodist Church. So, And we don't have a building yet, but we have services that we hold at the parish hall. Um, the... Uh Tell me something about the tribal school. Uh, did your children go there? No. My my daughter, when we moved here, I wasn't in, involved in the school board yet. Um, but she went, my older daughter went to Westy Pier, and that's where she graduated from. Mm -hmm. And my younger daughter, I sent her to um, Green Bay Christian School. And that was... That was that was uh, something else because the busing situation, you know, trying to get her back and forth to school. Oh, okay. Give me some. Uh, give me your take on the uh, on the travels. What caused you to become interested in the uh, uh, the school board situation? You know, uh, running for the school board uh, of the tribal school. I don't know what motivated me other than <clears throat> different ones who had asked me if I'd be interested in doing that was was saying that they, um, I guess as a compliment now that I think about it, is that they needed some good people on that um, on that board, somebody to make decisions and not be swayed by whatever political um, the political current of the of the time because everything in, in the community is political. Give me your uh, give me your overview in terms of the uh, the tribal school. Uh, you know, again, your interest on the school board, and then your involvement and your observations of uh, of the tribal school. Well, initially when I started. Um, There was, um, they just needed people to help with the school board, and that that's what was my primary interest. Um, I was on the school board, I was this, on the school board that um, helped build the turtle school as we now know it, because when I, when I first started, the school was housed in um, 
Norbert Hill Center, the entire school. And so it was during my tenure uh, that we built a turtle school. And it's a beautiful building, and I think that it's the turtle school itself, the philosophy of teaching children their history and their culture is very important. The fact that they have language in the elementary school particularly, um, I think is a plus. If we don't have our language, we don't have anything, and unfortunately, um, I don't know the language all that well. I started taking language classes, um, but I, I believe that our school could be the best school anywhere, and uh, it doesn't seem to be turning out that way. I know we have a lot of good students. We have a lot of st smart, smart students, intelligent young people that go to our schools. Um, but I think we have overcompensated for the way maybe we were treated in school, and our children aren't aren't really being helped by some of the things that we do. Uh, we're, we help them too much. Um, and I guess, uh, I don't know where that comes from, you know, um, but I know when my daughter was going to, <coughs> where my daughter was going to school in Green Bay, they didn't go on field trips um, free of charge. We had to pay for them. And, and the cost was not that much, but it was still a cost to the parent. And the travel school kids would go all the time, you know, to places like the Dells and stuff like that. And there wasn't any cost, which I don't know if that really helps them, you know, helps them appreciate what they have to do. Now, at least they're doing fundraisers where the kids have to raise um, some of their own money to do this. But before it was just all, you know, just wherever they want to go, take them, you know, that type of thing. Um, so I'm not sure that was really, that's really a helpful thing. Um, but as far as the education itself, I believe that the kids that come out of tribal school can be and are as well educated as any as any of the surrounding schools. It's what they desire to do. All right, let's go back to the Appeals Commission now. Uh, the uh, Appeals Commission is, is if I correct me, uh, is designed to be patterned after a court system? Correct. Um, how how has the appeals commission worked from your point of view uh, in terms of the what it had set out to achieve and where it's at now? Uh, has it deviated or is it still on track? Or just kind of give us an overview of, of uh, what you've experienced and how you see it. I don't believe it is what it could be. Um, when we initially started out with nothing to where we are, to where we were maybe five years ago, we had come a long, long way because um, we had developed a, a procedures for holding hearings. Um, and then we seemed to have stagnated and I don't know the cause of that, but probably the main cause is is that on the Appeals Commission there's 11 commissioners and there's three full-time positions. So you, But the three full-time positions only came into being maybe five years ago or six years ago. So you have 11 people who have other jobs or other responsibilities trying to work do develop something on a part-time basis. Um, develop something full-time on a part-time basis. So that was a lot of the problems. Um, but we did a lot in that as being um, part-time, you know, just having our other jobs and meeting in the evenings and weekends and stuff and, and uh, developing the court system. Um, I think that the tribal court system needs to be developed that um, in order to do, 
in order to protect the tribal sovereignty, you need to be able to self-govern yourself, and that means also um, having your own court. But we, it's it's not just appeals commission because I think it's the whole government structure because we don't have the laws for the court to to um, enforce. We don't have a lot of the things in place in order to have a, a true court system. If you have a law that says, um, we have hunting and fishing laws that, that are enforced by the, the herb board, I think, and um, our, uh, I don't know what that department's called. Anyway, if there's a um, hunting violation, anyway, they can be ticketed and whatever, and the, if uh, they have a problem with, with that ticket, they could bring that to the appeals commission. But um, there's no really enf enforcement of any laws that we do have. And if the Appeals Commission, right now we're, the Appeals Commission's main focus is more of an administrative body and they hear a lot of personnel issues. There's, and because <laughs> this is all, <laughs> it's all, um, There's so many factors involved because Wisconsin is a public law 280 state, which means that the state has, and the state ha and the tribe have concurrent jurisdiction. But the, on a reservation, then the any federal crimes are, are, the federal government has jurisdiction. So <clears throat> it's like a mishmash of things. So it's we're unique. The only okay. other reservation that's different in Wisconsin is Menominee, because they're not a, they're not under the Public Law 280. Okay. Um, in reference to uh, giving some recommendations to the to the youth of t of today, what kind of recommendations would you be? Would you be liking to share with them any comments or, or uh, concerns? Um, I think that um, the education is the primary the primary thing that every young person should strive for, and not necessarily. I'm not necessarily necessarily saying that every person needs to go to college, but a good education, because knowledge is power. And um, if you have knowledge of things, you you can work to change things or make things better. And the other thing I, is spirituality. You know that you need to have a good spiritual basis for whatever you're going to achieve, whatever you're trying to do. Any other things that you'd like to share with us that I neglected? I don't think so. Well, I want to thank you for taking the time out. And, and uh, oh, one other question: uh, Tell me what your take is on on uh, sovereignty. We only got a half hour now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm you know because you've worked with the. Uh, the Appeals Commission, you've worked with the tribal government now, I think you've got an inner inner ear and an inner vision of, of the things that go on. Maybe you could just share your observation in terms of sovereignty and what it means to you. Well, sovereignty means, to me, means the ability to govern yourself. And um, the Oneida tribe needs to protect that that sovereignty, that ability to govern themselves, <clears throat> uh, and they should do whatever they can to protect that, whether it's developing their own law and order code, their own tribal court. Um, and right now we have a good economic base um, which helps us go govern ourselves and give us the funds to do that. We have our own police department, and I think that all those things help enhance our sovereignty. Um, but the way the the courts are going, federal courts, supreme courts, they are slowly eroding our our sovereignty. Every time we sign a contract, we have to 
waiver, there's a limited waiver of sovereign immunity, which means, you know, we're more and more susceptible to other outside forces. Great. Right. I thank you. Appreciate it.